Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of this season as we reflect upon the birth of your Son. We thank you, Lord, for the incarnation, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we thank you, Lord, for the revelation concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is, his person and work. And as we study the book of John, help us have a greater appreciation of the Son and his authority over all creation. And Father, help us truly, as the hymn writer states, come let us adore him. And Father, help us to adore him by taking in the word of God by faith and help us to concentrate on the teaching of your word this morning and receive it with humility and faith. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John. John chapter 5, verse 30. John chapter 5, verse 30. Uh, in this section, uh, Jesus Christ responds to the accusations of the Jews. Really, the whole argument of what's going on here in John chapter 5 goes back to John chapter 5, uh, verse 16. So let's take a look at John 5, 16, and then we will see how Jesus responds to these accusations by the Jews. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And again, he healed an individual on the Sabbath day. So the Jews are making accusations against him. And Jesus answered and said, My father has been working unto now, and I have been working. He's simply doing what his father has commanded him. Now the response to that is in verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he had not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making him equal with God. And then he goes on to demonstrate that equality by various means. All future resurrection has been committed to the Son of Man. Uh, he is the one who can give eternal life to those who place his faith in him. Uh, judgment, all future judgment has been delegated to the Son of Man. And so all the way down through this passage, he's defending his deity and his authority against these Jews. And so that's what's going on all the way through the end of the chapter in John chapter 5. Now, locally in the context, we looked at the uh, resurrection program in uh, verses 29 and 30, and the fact that all who are in the graves will hear the voice of the Son of God in verse 28. And he speaks about two categories of resurrections, the resurrection of life and the resurrection of condemnation. And then in verse 30, he says, I of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And judging all of creation, including those who are resurrected to the judgment of condemnation, or the resurrection of condemnation, which also involves the great white throne judgment, his judgment is a fair judgment because he's doing what his Father is bidding. Just like he stated earlier in verse 16, my father is working and I'm working. He's simply reflecting the will of the father. And when he said, I can myself do nothing, in the sense that he is doing nothing on his own initiative, he came in complete submission to the father's will. So Jesus Christ is fulfilling the will of the father. And that's what he's defending here. And because it's coming from the father, it is just. And when he does judge in the future, it will be righteous because he's fulfilling the Father's will. He says, the reason for that is because I seek not my own will. I'm not here to seek my own agenda, but I have another agenda, and that is the purpose of the Father. So in his humanity, Jesus Christ came dependent upon the Father's will. Understand that Jesus Christ is both God and man. And certainly his deity is stated all the way through here. His authority over all creation to resurrect and judge, to give eternal life. He's defending the fact that he is equal with God in every aspect. But here he's saying that I'm here dependent upon the Father's will to accomplish his purpose and mission for my life. And we know ultimately that will is to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world, to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's begin looking at this. I of my own self can do nothing. Really, he's saying here on his own authority. That's what he's saying. When he says, I cannot do nothing, of course, 
We know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, uh, that Jesus Christ can do anything. He's omnipotent. But he's talking in relationship to the Father's will. And that's a context here. So he's saying that I cannot do anything on my own authority. We have what is called the kenosis prescription. Jesus Christ said clearly in the incarnation that Jesus Christ would come to fulfill the Father's will. And that's why he took on human flesh. So he began, by the way, this section with that statement. If you go back to verse 19, he said this, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. And this is his direct response to the Jews who were accusing him of calling God his Father, making himself equal with God. And he says, uh, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So he's simply repeating the Father's will. He's reflecting what the Father wants in healing this man on the Sabbath day uh, and doing all the other things that he will do in the future. He is working in conjunction with the Father, and that shows his equality with God the Father. So he began this section this way, and this is how this section ends. I can on my own self do nothing on my own initiative or my own authority because he's doing the Father's will. Now, the Son does not act independent of the Father, and that's very important. He does not, do, does not act independent of the Father, but was completely submissive to his Father's will. And as a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, he says, I've come to do the will of him who sent me. In the incarnation, he said, a body you prepared for me. So that body was given so that I might accomplish the mission of the Father. Again, including the uh, death on the cross. And so that was part of God's plan for him and his humanity. And he says, as I hear, I judge. And this shows that his judgment is identical with the judgment of God. There's nothing incompatible in what he does. It is completely and perfectly in harmony with what the Father wants. And his justice is the Son's justice. And his power is the Son's power. His will is the Son's will. And so he's doing everything perfectly in harmony with the Father. His judgment is identical with the judgment of God, as John Philip states. Hence, his judgment is flawless, omniscient, and just. Think about that. His judgment is flawless. He makes no errors in judgment. He is omniscient. He is a judge who knows all the facts. And when he acts, it is just and righteous. He is the perfect judge because he is the God-man. And therefore, when he executes future judgment, it will be perfect because he is deity. He is deity. So this is a strong argument for the deity of the Son, equal in every way with the Father. Now, my judgment is righteous. What's interesting, we turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation 19. Let's turn over there. And we're not going to put all the verses on the screen. That's why you do bring your Bibles to church. I don't want to discourage that. I, it's a, the PowerPoint is a facilitator, but not replacer of your scripture, your Bible. So we do want to turn there to Revelation 19. We'll look at the fact, the Revelation 19, that God the Father's judgment is just. Now, having revealed the future events of the tribulation, as the tribulation is unwinding, in Revelation 19, we have the preparation for the coming of Christ to the earth to defeat his enemies and to establish his righteous kingdom. We have this statement in heaven, anticipating his justice, including judging the harlot Babylon, near the end of the tribulation. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he had judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he had avenged on her the blood of his servant shed by her. This false religious system in the tribulation murdered 
many believers, tribulation saints, we would call them, during that time. And God judged that evil system in that evil city, Babylon. And so we have, I think here, God the Father's judgment described as righteous. But just within a few verses, we have the righteous justice of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And we know that this is clearly a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes to defeat his enemies, that will be right. That will be just. You hear about just wars. Are there such things as wars that are just? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jesus Christ is the ultimate avenger of wrongs doing, wrongs done to believers. And he will defeat the enemies of the believer, including the Antichrist and the false prophet. And therefore, the wrath of God is coming down. And he is literally coming down to defeat the enemies that, that appear at the last final phase of this campaign of Armageddon and defeat them. And he does so with perfect righteousness. And notice verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. I think symbolic language, certainly, but speaking of the spoken word of God. Think about how God created the universe. Let there be light. Let there be. And so God spoke and it appeared. And so the spoken word has power. And Jesus Christ will speak the word, I believe, and his enemies will be defeated. And that sharp sword, which is analogous to the word of God, will come out of his mouth and defeat the nations. And he himself will do that alone. He will rule with a rod of iron. That phrase is used in Psalm 2 about the Messiah ruling over the nations with great power. We heard about the, the phrase ruling with an iron fist, ruling with great authority, that rod of iron showing he will rule with absolute authority when he establishes his kingdom on the earth. He himself, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And so he will implement total righteous judgment upon his enemies and his wrath. We, we are squeamy sometimes when we hear about the wrath of God. We even have, by the way, a praise early on in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. We have the Lamb who unleashes the sealed judgments on the earth, and we have the wrath of the Lamb. Think about that. That seems like a contradiction. A, ra a Lamb is an innocent little cuddly animal led to the slaughter, but we have an angry Lamb. We have the wrath of the Lamb, and that's what we have here, the Lamb of God and his righteous indignation, and his justice and wrath, pouring out judgment upon his enemies. And in verse 16, he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so he is the ultimate King of Kings and will rule over all the nations of the earth. And so he will implement righteous judgment and then there will be those later on after his kingdom that will stand before that same judge at the great white throne judgment. And he will have the right justice to execute sentence upon unbelievers because they reject it. It's the very same judge who was their substitute. Think about that. The judge could be their savior, but they rejected their savior and therefore it's their judge now. Yeah, it came back. Thank you. Uh, let's take a look then at uh, this phrase. Jesus, uh, Ron uh, Trail, in his exegetical summary, states this. Uh, Jesus' unqualified commitment to please the one who sent him guarantees that all he says and does is completely in accord with the Father's will. Again, that's what he's saying. I do not do anything that's not from the Father's will or purpose. We are in perfect total harmony and agreement. The reason for that is why, as he hears, he judges, and that judgment is perfectly righteous, 
The reason for that is because he's not seeking his own agenda. He's not seeking to do his own will. You remember what Jesus prayed in the garden as he's facing death, as he's facing the most horrendous time that he has ever experienced. Three hours on the cross when he cried out in Psalm 22. My God, my God. He screamed that for three hours continuously. Why have you forsaken me? He's anticipating that. And all of Satan and his demons is opposing him in the garden. And he's sweating blood, drops of blood. And he's facing that. And he prays, Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering. And the book of Psalms describe that cup that Jesus would drink down to the dregs. Have you ever drunk a cup of coffee and you had that ground sometimes on the bottom? And it's bitter. It's bitter. He said, this is a cup of suffering. I'm going to drink all of it. I have to drink the whole thing. All the righteous judgment, all the sins of the whole world will be upon my, upon my humanity soon. And he's praying, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but what? Yours be done. It was always what the Father wanted. Always what the Father wanted. What a great example to us. And the cup of suffering we have to face. Sometimes we pray, let it pass. But the Lord says, I want you to go through this trial. And I'm permitting it in my divine purpose and will. So we have to ultimately pray for God's will to be done in our life. Not my will. Not what I want. Not my agenda. Not my purpose. But yours. Let's take a look at a couple passages along this line. John 6, 38. John chapter 6, verse 38. Now, there are several places in the Gospel of John that he states clearly that he's come down from heaven. His pre-existence, by the way, is affirmed with the statement, I've come down from heaven. Obviously, he existed before his birth. I came down from heaven. That shows his pre-existence. And, of course, John 1.1 1, 1 shows his eternal pre-existence. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, the Word became flesh. Christ had a beginning in his humanity, but in his deity, he was eternal in nature. And certainly, uh, uh, Isaiah, or, uh, Micah 5, 2, we think about that Christmas verse, that in Bethlehem of Judea, one is going to be born whose going forth have been of old from eternity past. And therefore, the one who would be born physically in a little town of Bethlehem as a human being, was one who has always existed. He is both God and man. So the Old Testament past, the Old Testament scriptures that prophesied the Messiah taught clearly the Messiah would be both God and man in one person. And that certainly is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he stated this, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And what is that will? If we read verse 38 or 39, <laughs> And 40, that will is to secure the salvation of all who believe. <laughs> Eternal security, by the way. In verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should lose how many? Zero. The good shepherd keeps the sheep. It's not for the sheep to keep themselves. It's up to the shepherd to keep the sheep. And that's why later in John 10, verse 28 through 30, he said, no one's going to pluck you out of my hand. And the, and the only way that can be accomplished is through my complete satisfaction, divine justice, by dying on the cross for their sins and making payment in full and finishing the work, which he cried out in John 19.30, it is finished, Telestai, paid in full. Notice that of all he has given me, I should lose zero, nothing, but will raise it up at the last day. That is the resurrection of the righteous, as we studied in John 5, 29. Your resurrection is guaranteed, and it's a resurrection of life and to the fullness of your eternal life forever. As you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will guarantee that resurrection. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, there's only one thing you need to do. What must I do to be saved? 
Paul asked, uh, the Philippian jailer asked Paul, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Faith alone in Christ alone. The one who believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up in the last day. That person will be resurrected to life, fullness of life. Securing the believer. Christ would do that by paying for their sins on the cross. And that was the Father's mission from the beginning, from the incarnation. Jesus was wrapped with burial cloth, swallowing clothes, which pictured his death. And myrrh, which pictures judgment. And the symbolism of the incarnation points to his mission and purpose to go to the cross, to be our savior, to be our sacrifice, to be the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world in John 1, 29. Hebrews 10, 37. The book of Hebrews speaks of the will of the Father, by the way. And, you know, Jesus Christ came to accomplish that will. And uh, Jesus Christ will come one day for the church. And he says, a little while he will come and will not tarry. Think about the will that he will come for his own. He will one day come back for those of the church age believer. And Jesus Christ, before he took on human nature, he indicated that there was a body prepared for him. And Jesus Christ came to accomplish the will of God in that body of humanity. Now notice Romans chapter 15, verse 3. Romans chapter 15. Christ came not to please himself. He came to please the Father and accomplish his purpose. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. And therefore Christ did not react when he was suffering he did not react verbally. He did not uh, unleash his wrath at that point, at the first coming. He came to fulfill the purpose of Christ, of the Father. And that, therefore, should be an example to us as believers to fulfill his purpose and plan and not to seek our own agenda. The will of the Father is the issue. In Matthew 26, a couple more passages here. Matthew 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. <clears throat> and this is his prayer, as mentioned earlier, in the garden. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He ultimately left, left it into the hand of the Father's purpose. I think sometimes when we demand our own agenda, we miss out on God's blessing. We want God to do X, Y, and Z in our life. We demand it. And if it doesn't happen, why didn't you let this happen? Why did you let this thing happen in my life? And we miss out on God's wider blessing because we want our way. We don't want God's will in our life. And we should always see that if we believe that God is a good God, and trusting ourselves to him by faith is always the best option. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said to him, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. And to do what? Finish his work. <laughs> I'm going to complete the mission that God gave me as the Son of God. I'm going to accomplish his agenda. The disciples asked them in, in John chapter 6, verse uh, 20, 39 and 40. Actually, um, 
verse 28 and 29. They said to him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God that you might believe in him whom he sent. That's God's will and work for you. And then verse 39 says this, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but will raise it up at the last day. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have the everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Again, this is the Father's will and his plan. By the way, he said, the will of him who sent me. 25 times in this gospel, he, is, uh, he asserts that he was sent by the Father. How can you get around the pre-existence of Christ by ignoring that phrase 25 times? The Father sent him. He came down from heaven. He is the bread that came down from heaven. He is the one who gives life. And therefore, 25 times. Now, let's see how many times, even in John chapter 5, the context here, the fact that he was sent by the Father. Beginning in John 5, 23. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He does not honor the Son, does not honor the Father. Look at the last three words. Who sent him? Don't ignore that. Who sent him? Verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, who sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come to judgment, but has passed from death to life. Verse 30, uh, I can do myself, do nothing as I hear I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Uh, verse 36, I have a greater witness than John's for the work which the Father has given me to finish. The very works I do bear witness to me that the Father has what? Sent me. Verse 37, the Father himself who has sent me. Once again. And then verse 38, the next verse. You do not have his words abiding in you because whom he sent. Notice him you do not believe. So, he reaffirms this over and over. When the Bible repeats something, we need to pay attention. <laughs> when, it, when he says over and over, who sent me? Who sent me? Who sent me? And so he does everything in perfect harmony with the Father. Later on in John 10, 30, he will say, I and my Father are one in essence. Now we know the doctrine of the Trinity, there are three separate members of the Godhead. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but there's only one God. One God. And so we sing that great hymn, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And therefore, he does everything. He has the same attributes as the Father. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit share equally the essence, what we call, of God. All the attributes. And therefore, he cannot act apart from God. He does everything in perfect harmony with the Father. Now, if you ask in your mind, when he was tempted in Matthew 4, was it possible for Jesus and his humanity to yield to temptation? And the answer is no. No, it was not. <clears throat> because he's perfectly God and man in one person. Now, I've given the illustration before of this. If you have an iron bar, which cannot bend, which represents the deity of Christ, by the way, and you have a little coat hanger, which is bendable, temptable, representing the humanity of Christ, separate by itself, if Christ was only a human being, he could yield to temptation. But together, united together in one person, we call that the hypostatic union. It's a fancy term referring to the union of God and man in one person. You cannot bend. So we have the biblical theological doctrine of the impeccability of Jesus Christ. And the book of Hebrews says he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. He could not yield to temptation. He could be tempted, but he could not bend to temptation. Imagine the pressure of yielding to the power of temptation, or feeling the pressures of temptation, which he felt as a human being, but not ever yielding to that because he's completely 
hand it over to do the Father's agenda and Father's purpose and will. And that's our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was sent by the Father. Now, verse 31, we begin another section here. Uh, this section here is not uh, incompatible with what he stated earlier. I think he's furthering, furthering answering these Jews who object to his uh, deity. And so he's going to give a list of evidence of witnesses to his deity. And so we have the key word in this section is witness. Witness. In verse 31, he says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And we look at that and say, uh-oh, what's happening here? I don't understand this. What do you mean his witness is not true? Now we have to explain what he's saying here. We know that everything. He, didn't he say that I am the way, the truth, and the life? In John 14, 6, Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. By the way, good hermeneutics, in order to interpret the difficult passages, we go to the clear ones first, right? We go to the clear passages and let them interpret the unclear. So we know whatever this says, it cannot contradict the fact that Jesus Christ is the truth. And everything he does is true. So how, come, how can he say my witness is not true? Now he's talking about legal evidence in a court of law. So think about legal terms. We have various witnesses that affirm facts. And this is how evidence is weighed in court. You have eyewitnesses accounts. So he's listing eyewitness accounts of his deity as if in a courtroom. Picture that legal setting here. So he says, and under the Mosaic law, everything is established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Okay? Not simply one. One person cannot, even though that witness is true, that alone is not enough in a courtroom setting to affirm the statement of whatever you're trying to prove. Under the law, it at least required two or three witnesses. And so he's going to list five, at least, witnesses to his deity in this section. Now, certainly he is a witness himself, but that by itself is not enough evidence. So you're going to stack up evidence upon evidence to these unbelieving Jews to prove the fact that he is who he claims to be. And he's going to list various witnesses in a courtroom setting. Okay, now, the Greek word witness, marturo, we get the word martyr from this word here as a witness. Uh, we'll look at the English word here, martyr, from this Greek word. But the simple word means to testify to the truth of what one has seen, heard, or knows. That's what a witness is. One who testifies to the truthfulness of what is seen, heard, or knows. And Jesus Christ is a witness. This word witness is used nine times in verses 31 through 37. So if you look at this section here, you can count nine times witness, 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 witness throughout this section. The key word here, as a matter of fact, is a key word in the book of John. One of the key terms in the Gospel of John. The noun form of this word is used 14 times in John. 14 times in John. The verbal form is used 33 times in John. So what's our total in the Gospel of John? 47 times. And that shows the importance of this term in John's theology. 47 times we had the word witness in the Gospel of John. But even this short little section, within a few verses, used nine times. Witness, witness. <clears throat> now, here's the English definition of the word martyr coming from the Greek. This is, uh, by the way, the, um, uh, the Webster's uh, 1820 Dictionary, which I love, by the way, early dictionary. Uh, you know, he used scripture, by the way, in his definitions, many of his definitions, if you have that green dictionary, uh, great. And he, uses, he says this comes from this Greek word, here our word used here for the word martyr, uh, one who by his death bears witness to the truth of the gospel. Think about Stephen was a first Christian martyr. He bore witness to the truth of the gospel. And so basically, one who bears witness to something that is true. 
and that is the word witness. Something who testifies. The word testify, by the way, is also translated as witness. So you'll see the word testify or witness coming from the same family of Greek words there for a witness. Testify, witness. Now, if I alone testify about myself, here's how I translate this phrase, by the way. Uh, I was looking at several translations along here, and I think this very clarifies what he's trying to say here. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not admissible as legal evidence. That's how I translate this phrase. So if I'm simply by myself testifying, that would not be admissible as legal evidence under Jewish law or any in court at that time. Under Jewish law, it would have to be at least two or three. All right. Now, Let's compare John 8, 13. John chapter 8, verse 13. <clears throat> then the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Uh, you know, obviously they, were, they understood that you need at least two or three. But in spite of that, notice what Jesus stated in verse 14. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. See that right there? My witness is true. For I know where I come from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. You judge by human standards. So he says, yeah, I know as far as legal evidence, that's not enough. But in spite of that, I'm a credible witness. That's what he's affirming there. So what he's saying here is, I am a credible witness. My witness is valid. But obviously, you need more than one as far as legal testimony. All right. Now, um, verse, 14, verse 18 uh, let's take a look at verse 18 of John 8. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bear witness of me. There's your two. The Father bore witness of me as well. And by the way, in John 5, we'll see that as well. Uh, John the Baptist will be a witness. We'll list some of the witnesses here, I think, in the next uh, PowerPoint slide. But Deuteronomy 19.15, let's go back to this principle Deuteronomy 19.15. In the Old Testament law, in order to accuse someone as far as a death sentence, you need at least two credible witnesses. You can't have someone rise up and claim, oh, look at that person. I saw that person kill that person. All right. Now, I, I know that you can convict on individuals less than that today in court, but... Under the law, look at this in Deuteronomy 19:15. <clears throat> One witness shall not raise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter will be established. Because you have the idea of false witnesses. They do people who claim things are not true. Falsely accused. That's protective. Protective against a individual who has a vendetta against someone in court. Um so, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything will be established. Now, even with the death penalty. Now, what did the Pharisees accuse Jesus? They accused him of blasphemy. And blasphemy, under the Mosaic law, demanded the death penalty. You're claiming to be God. When you state my father's working and I'm working, you're claiming equality with God. The Jews understood that Jesus claimed to be God. Theologians don't understand that today, <laughs> unfortunately. I hear this, and I had a friend of mine who stated this, and I was like, I couldn't believe it. You've been in cemetery too long. I mean, seminary too long. Uh, Jesus never claimed to be God. I said, Are, wait, do you hear that from your Jehovah's Witness neighbor? Why do you give me that gobbledygook? Do you want him to say the word, I am God? He said it in so many terms. I and my father are one. 
uh, all the names and the works. He, over and over, he affirmed deity. They want, they want the friend, I am God. Well, he doesn't have to state that in those words. He stated it clearly. The Jews, they understood, I'm working, my father's working. You're claiming God's your father, unique relationship to the father that no one else has? Yeah, <laughs> that's a claim of deity. You're making yourself equal to God. You deserve to be stoned. You deserve the death penalty. So he's defending himself. He says, you know what? You're accusing me of blasphemy, but I have other legal witnesses that affirm that what I'm saying is true. And that's what he's doing through the section, defending his deity against these Jews who are accusing him of blasphemy. Now let's look at this statement here by uh, Craig Keener. <clears throat> Confronted by accusations that he is guilty of blasphemy, a capital offense, in John 5, 18, Jesus responds by citing witnesses in his defense. He accommodates the biblical rule that requires at least two witnesses to validate testimony in a capital case. And he cites Numbers 25, 30, Deuteronomy 17, 6, and Numbers 19, 15. Indeed, testimony on one's own behalf was easily dismissed in a court of law. Now, he's affirming then multiple witnesses. Now, let's take a look, and I'll, show, I'll put this all up here on the screen. The witnesses of five witnesses in this section. Christ did witness of himself in various ways. And then we'll see that John the Baptist was a witness affirming that he is the Son of God. The works of Christ, the miracles that Christ performed validated that true claim. The Father himself, when he was baptized, this is my beloved Son, hear him. He was a verbal witness that he claimed to be God. And then the scripture, Old Testament scripture that pointed to the Messiah demonstrated that he was who he claimed to be. So he's stacking up legal evidence as in a court of law against their faulty accusation of blasphemy. All right, Christ's witness of himself. He's equal in working. In verses 17 through 19, he's equal in knowing. In verses 19 through 21, he's equal in resurrecting. All authority is committed to the Son to resurrect those in the future, showing his deity. Uh, verse 21, 28, 29, equal in judging, all judgment. That authority has been handed to the Son of God. He has authority over all to judge, showing his deity. In verse 22 and 27, equal in honor. In verse 23, equal in giving life, eternal life. Only God can do that. In verses 25, I think of verse 26 there. And then equal in giving life in verse 26. So, he shows his equality with God. And we study that section. And then and John the Baptist will give witness to the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. In verses 31 through 35, then we'll see the miracles that he performed, including back to healing that man on the Sabbath day. That was a witness that they did not want to listen. There was evidence there but they want to explain the evidence away, see? And that's what the Pharisees said, by the way, the miracles of your form. No, he's doing that. Later on, the religious leaders will say, he's doing that by satanic power. It's evidence that he is the son of God. The Old Testament predicted the Messiah would come performing miracles, but they dismissed that evidence. But that was one of the evidences showing who he was. The works of Christ, his miracles. Verse 36, then the Father himself verbalized that as his baptism. On several occasions on the Mount of Transfiguration, remember, they heard a voice from heaven, Peter, James, and John on the Mount. This is my beloved son, hear him. Several occasions we have the Father stating affirmatively, this is my son, affirming his deity. And then the word of God, certainly, he says, look at the scripture, search the scripture. You need to go back to your Old Testament scriptures showing that the Messiah would be both God and man. He would be deity. So the word of God is witness to and affirms the fact that he is who he claimed to be. 
And this is the legal evidence in a court scene that he's stacking up against these Jewish believers. Unbelievers, excuse me. Now, verse 32 says, There is another witness, another who bears witness of me. I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. <clears throat> and here he's referring to John the Baptist. Let's read this section here. Um, in John uh, chapter 5, back in verse uh, 32 and 33. Verse 33, you have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Now, at the beginning of the Gospel of John, we have John's testimony of who Jesus Christ was. He said he's the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. He is the Christ. He is the Anointed One, the Messiah. Uh, John the Baptist clearly proclaimed Christ as the forerunner. He prepared the way of the Lord. The Old Testament passages, when we look at John the Baptist's ministry, he was to prepare the way for God, Jehovah. And uh, he, therefore, was a credible witness. Um, but that is a witness that the nation denied. You know, as he laid up these witnesses as in a courtroom setting, you know, they tried to refute those witnesses, just like people today do. Here's another witness. Here's another scripture. We, don't re we reject the authority of the word of God. We reject his miracles. We reject the evidence. We reject Christ. In your life, we and people don't want to hear the truth, even though you present evidence. Here it is. People try to easily dismiss the legal evidence of who he claims to be. Um, notice verse 34. Yet I do not receive testimony from men, meaning that's not the weight of my credibility. It doesn't depend on men's witness, but I'm using that, though, as evidence. I'm not dependent upon that, but I'm using that. But I say these things that you might be saved. That's interesting. He wants her, and this time, this time I think he's using the word sozo there for uh, salvation by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, because they were unbelief, unbelievers. He's presenting his claim of deity and the one who could give eternal life so that they would believe in him for everlasting life. And therefore, for a while, the nation rejoiced in the message of John, but that dimmed. He was the burning and shining lamp. John the Baptist was a little handheld lamp, Herodian lamp that they lit in those days. It had oil, and you could, instead of a flashlight, you carried it around. It illuminated wherever you went. Little Herodian lamp. He's a, he's a lamp. But Jesus Christ is like the sunshine. He's the light of the world. Interesting. We'll look at the contrast in two Greek words for lamp and light. And uh, notice here in verse uh, 35, he was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But they quickly dismissed John. Remember Jesus... <clears throat> He came associating with publicans and sinners. And they called him a wine bibber and a drunkard. And John came associating not with, uh, you know, the publicans and sinners. He was kind of aloof on the desert, ascetic in one sense, not asceticism, but he was aloof from society. And they called him demon possessed. And Jesus said, Wisdom is justified by your children, meaning that, you know, you can't attack it, have it both ways, you know. They're looking at his, his character and they're dismissing his credibility. Uh, just out of simple unbelief. People do that today. All the evidence in the world sometimes cannot convince people. Hopefully we stand with the authority of the word of God. We have to begin there as Christians. We gotta defend the authority of scripture. And if you dismiss the authority of the word of God, you have nothing. You have nothing. And so once we accept the authority of the word of God, then if God said it, then I need to believe it. Uh, and I need to accept his witness of Jesus as revealed in the scripture, the word of God. So let's take a look at verse 32. There's another who's bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Now, going back to John's ministry in Matthew chapter 3, uh, John's Ministry is mentioned in all four synoptic gospels, all four gospels, actually, synoptics are the first three, but all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And in Matthew 3.17, notice this. When he was baptized, we have the witness of the Father, and John the Baptist was there. And he affirmed this. <clears throat> in verse 17, suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. By the way, you have the Trinity. Let's go back to verse 16 in this baptism event. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. So you have the Son of God in the water, coming up out of the water. All right? The heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. There's a Holy Spirit. All right? Second member of the Godhead. And then the third member of the Godhead appears with the voice from heaven. Father, Son, Spirit. Great Trinitarian verse. Just like Matthew 28, the end of the Gospel of Matthew, going all over, preach the Gospel. There's a Trinity baptizing them in the singular name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Great Trinitarian verse. Here's another, this one is a great Trinitarian verse. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There's a verbal witness. And John heard it right there on the spot. I'm sure others heard that witness. Let's take a look at John 129. John 129. <clears throat> John's ministry is elaborated more fuller, fully in the Gospel of John. John the Baptist ministry. Uh, in John 129, now, this is the testimony, another term for witness, similar word there. This is a testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Who are, who are you? Well, what's your relationship to the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? No. He says, he confessed and did not deny, saying, I am not the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And they ask him, what then are you, Elijah? Remember the prophet Elijah coming back, Malachi? I think that will be fulfilled in the tribulation period when the two witnesses come. Elijah will come back before the second coming of Christ. Are you an Elijah? He says, I am not. He denied that. Now, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but he wasn't Elijah. All right. Are you the prophet? That's the prophet predicted in Deuteronomy. Moses what, there was another prophet that arises after Moses. That's a Messianic prophecy in Deuteronomy. And he, are you the prophet? Uh, that section of scripture is Messianic. He answers, no, I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. They said, well, then who are you? What's your relationship then? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. I'm the forerunner to the Messiah, the Lord. Uh, now, there were those who, who sent him were from the Pharisees. They asked him, saying, what then do you, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? What's your role of baptism? He said, I am baptized with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who is coming after me. Who is preferred before me? He takes preeminence above me in my ministry. <clears throat> Whose sandals, I, sandal straps, I'm not worthy to unloose. I'm not worthy to untie, in modern vernacular, his shoestrings. These things were done in Beth Barabbas, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me. Now he uses language. We went into this when we studied this section. He was before me. He uses the verb tense there to show his eternal preexistence. So he uses the two, two verb tenses to say that he eternally preexisted before me. And he is and preference far above me, a strong affirmation of deity. I do not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw, here's John's testimony, legally, I saw the Spirit descending upon him like a dove and remain upon him. 
I did not know him, but he who sent me the baptize of water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And he would do that, by the way, at Pentecost. He would remember that prediction in Acts 1.5. He would incorporate individuals into the body of Christ, and that occurred in Acts 2. I have seen and testified, notice here, that this is the Son of God. That's John's witness. He's the Son of God. He affirmed who he was. And you know what? Jesus said, John is correct. John is correct. That's me. That's who I am. And really today, you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And if you're not saved, place your faith in him, the one who died on the cross, to give you eternal life. And when you affirm that, he is able to give you eternal life by faith in him, you're testifying the fact that the scripture is true and what Jesus said in the word of God is true. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word this morning. And we do certainly, as further witnesses of your truth, affirm those of us who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus as Savior that what Jesus states is credible. And thank you, Lord, for the word of God that shows and clearly reveals who Jesus is. Help us to be a witness for you. And even if we are facing death at the point of denying or, or verbalizing our affirmation or our faith, help us to sound, stand strong and affirm who Jesus is. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.